chapter 5. Let's look at verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of their camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a dead body. You shall put out both male and female. You shall put them outside the camp, that they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. And the children of Israel did so, and put them outside the camp. As the Lord spoke to Moses, so the children of Israel did. Anyone having an infectious skin disease, leprosy, or something like that, anybody having a discharge of some sort, or anyone who touched a dead body, these people could not fellowship with the Lord at the tabernacle. Not only that, they could not be with their fellow Israelites either. You say, why? Well, health reasons. But there's a spiritual reason also. It has some symbolic value as so many of the things in the book of Numbers and Leviticus and Exodus have. All these diseases, all these problems, left the person ceremonially unclean. And this ceremonially uncleanness symbolizes sin in the scripture and you see like these diseases and like these unclean conditions sin severs fellowship sin sin cuts off your fellowship with God and really it cuts off that fellowship in the spirit that you could otherwise enjoy with somebody else who was filled with the Holy Spirit of God oh that's such a wonderful thing to experience you know, when two people are filled with the Spirit of God, they both love Jesus. And they can sit down and talk about the Lord and just have a tremendous time and be a great blessing to each other. But if there's sin in one of their lives, that cuts it off. The triangle between them and God is cut off. And you see, that's what this ceremonially uncleanliness symbolized. That's why... That's why they had to be cut off from the tabernacle, which meant fellowship with God, and they had to be cut off from their fellow Israelites and situated outside the camp someplace. That's what sin does. Oh, it wastes a perfectly, perfectly good life. Look at verse 5. But there's an answer. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. When a man or woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess the sin which he has done. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full value plus one-fifth of it, and give it to the one he has wronged. But if the man has no kinsman to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of the atonement with which the atonement is made for him. Verse 9 says that every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel which they bring to the priest shall be his, and every man's holy things shall be his. Whatever any man gives the priest shall be his. Well, we see here the law of compensation and we learn also that any sin against man is also sin against God in fact all sin is first and foremost sin against God we have violated his holiness but any sin against man is also a sin against God and as a result both the victim and God deserve compensation they deserve satisfaction if a person harmed another person financially 
they had to compensate for any loss, plus 20%. God wanted to make sure crime didn't pay, didn't he? Uh, if the offended person was dead, that means he didn't have, he didn't get the uh, the criminal, the sinner did not get off free. If his victim was dead, then the uh, the sinner he would have to pay the survivors. If the man had no survivors, the compensation was to go to the Lord's work. It was to be given to the priest for the work of the tabernacle. So either way compensation had to be made that was in addition to the sin offerings and the trespass offerings and the confession of sins that was directed toward God let's look at verse 11 and the Lord spoke to Moses saying speak to the children of Israel and say to them if any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him and a man lies with her carnally and it has and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and it is concealed that she has defiled herself and there was no witness against her nor was she caught if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife who has defiled herself or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife although she has not defiled herself. Then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil on it and put no frankincense on it, because it is a grain offering of jealousy, an offering for remembering, for bringing iniquity to remembrance. Adultery was simply not tolerated in the covenant between God and his people. If a husband so much as suspected his wife to be guilty, he could bring her before the priest and go through this ritual that we're about to look at to see if she was indeed guilty or if his suspicions were, were just based on nothing. Look at verse 16 and notice what was to happen. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. Then the priest shall stand the woman before the Lord, uncover the woman's head, and put the offering for remembering in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. Let's stop there for a second. The priest began this ritual for learning the innocence or guilt of the wife by presenting her before the Lord at the tabernacle. He took holy water. He took water that had been blessed and mixed it with dust. Now, look at verse 19. And we're going to read an extended portion of Scripture. Actually, we're going to read 19 through the end of the chapter, verse 31. But follow along in your Bible and notice what would, what would take place. And the priest shall put her under oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray to uncleanness while under your husband's authority, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse, and he shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people when the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell and may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot then the woman shall say Amen so be it then the priest shall write these curses in a book and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water 
and he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And the water that brings a curse shall enter into, into her to become bitter. Then the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, shall wave the offering before the Lord, and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering as its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell, her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if the woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. This is the law of jealousy, when a wife while under her husband's authority goes astray and defiles herself or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife and he shall stand the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute all this law upon her then the man shall be free from iniquity but that woman shall bear her guilt the woman was forced to repeat an oath that she would suffer if guilty and be okay if innocent. The oath was written and the ink was then blotted out into the holy water. And the woman drank that holy water. If she was innocent, she'd be okay. If guilty, she'd get sick. God was in control of this sin. He established it and he would make sure that it would happen just as he said. Now, it should be noted that her sickness, the sickness described here, could not, would not be caused by the ingredients put into that, into that water. I mean, she would not become unfruitful. She would not become uh, sterile. You know, I mean, it just would not cause that. So this was a, a supernatural judgment by God if she was found to be guilty. It had nothing in the world to do with the water that she drank. Let's go into chapter 6. And we're going to look at the law of the Nazarite in this chapter. Verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, when either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation he shall be holy to the Lord. And if anyone dies very suddenly beside him, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. Then on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned by reason of the dead body. And he shall sanctify his head that same day. He shall consecrate to the Lord the days of his separation and bring a male lamb in its first year as a trespass offering. But the former days shall be lost because of his separation, 
because his separation was defiled. Well, a lot of words there, a lot of verses there concerning the Nazarite vow. The, the, the word Nazarite means one separated. A person who takes a Nazarite vow is separated completely unto God. And uh, this was a voluntary vow, a voluntary vow of consecration. Nobody could force somebody to do this. It was a voluntary vow of total consecration to God for a specific period of time. No rules as far as who had to do it and how long they had to do it for. But during his consecration, he had to avoid certain things to be set apart completely to God. He had to avoid, for example, all products of the vine, including all beverages, whether they were fermented or not. He could not cut his hair. Uh, he could not come in contact with a corpse. Very strict rules concerning this time. And verse 13 says, Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and he shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering, one ram without blemish as a peace offering, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and their grain offering with their drink offerings. Then the priest shall bring them before the Lord and offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall also offer its grain offering and its drink offering. When the time came for the vow to expire, The Nazarite brought a wide range of offerings to the tabernacle. They included the sin offering. That sin offering that he brought was to atone for any unintentional sin committed during that period of the vow. It also included a burnt offering. And the burnt offering symbolized his total devotion to God. It also included a fellowship offering. And the fellowship offering symbolized that he and the Lord were in harmony with each other, fellowshipping, separated unto one another for that period of time. You know, you look at this Nazarite vow, and it's really a pattern of, of what should be the norm for every Christian. The moment we commit a sin, we must confess our sin to God and get back in fellowship with Him. Uh, we should be totally devoted to God. Every minute of every day, you know, our life should be a living burnt offering unto the Lord. Total devotion to Him. And if that is the case, if we have confessed our sins, and if we are walking with the Lord, you know, the fellowship will be wonderful between us and God. Verse 18. Then the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the boiled shoulder of the ram, one unleavened cake from the basket, and one unleavened wafer, and put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated hair. And the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. They are holy for the priest, together with the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering. After that the Nazarite may drink wine. Verse 21 says, This is the law of the Nazarite who vows to the Lord the offering for his separation. And besides that, whatever else his hand is able to provide. According to the vow which he takes, so he must do according to the law of his separation. In an act 
that symbolized the commitment of the whole Nazarite experience to the Lord. The person shaved his hair and burnt it on the altar of his fellowship offering. He then made a wave offering of the finest portion of his fellowship offering. And the wave offering, of course, meant that the portion was presented as a sacrifice to the Lord. And then it was presented to his priest. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 7. Look at verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them. Stop there for a second. This priestly blessing was a divinely inspired prayer. It requested that God would meet every need of his people. And God says, this is what I want you to pray. You pray this prayer for the people. This is how you bless them. And it goes like this. Verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. Stop there. In other words, may God provide you with all the good things you need. He was to pray, may God provide you with all the good things you need. May he also guard you from anyone or anything that would hurt you in any way. Verse 25. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. When Moses spoke to God on Sinai, everyone knew he had been with the Lord. You remember why? It was because his face literally shined, didn't it? It literally shined. Remember? Beams of divine glory shot out from his face. It shined with the glory of Almighty God. The prayer here in verse 25 is that the Lord's presence would be known and felt by his people. The prayer is that his presence would be made known through an abundance of grace that God would pour out on them. And God would be glorified. And His glory would shine forth from the Israeli camp as He blessed His people. Not the, not the literal shining on everyone's face, but you know the uplifting of the countenance of the people because they were so filled with the joy of the Lord. When a believer is walking with the Lord and fellowshipping with the Lord and other believers, the glory of God will be seen in their faces. I mean, it really will. The countenance will reflect the joy of the Lord. Look at verse 26. The prayer continues. Aaron, you're, you're supposed to bless the children of Israel saying this also. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, the priest was to pray and God's people were to pray that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon them. In other words, that God would turn his face toward them with a gracious smile. That's what that means. And I'll tell you what, when the God of the universe looks at you and smiles, you're in good shape. I'll tell you what, you know he's doing that to you? You know that's how much he loves you? Yeah, in spite of all of your mistakes, in spite of all of your failures, in spite of every one of your sins, the God of the universe looks at you and smiles. And one major result is that you'll have peace when that happens. Oh, when you think about that, and you know that's happening, you'll have peace. And God's not just talking about an absence of war either. He's not just talking about an absence of inner, absence of inner strife either. Peace means an abundance of security. Peace means an abundance of health and contentment and peace with God and with man. Look at verse 27. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. The Lord says that by pronouncing this blessing the priest will actually place the Lord's name on his people. In other words, the Lord will be with his people and they will experience that reality, the presence of God through an abundance of blessing. You know, the Lord's blessings, the Lord's mighty works, 
declare that his name is near. That's what the book of Psalms tells us. And, you know, if his, if his blessings prove that, that his name is near, then saying that God will put his name on his people means that he will fill them with blessing and they will know that his presence is with them. Well, let's go into chapter 7 of the book of Numbers. Verse 1 says, Now it came to pass, when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle, that he anointed it and sanctified it and all its furnishings, and the altar and all its utensils. So he anointed them and sanctified them. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of their fathers' houses, who were the leaders of the tribes and over those who were numbered, made an offering. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered carts and twelve oxen, a cart for every two of the leaders, and for each one an ox. And they presented them before the tabernacle. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Accept these from them, that they may be used in doing the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall give them to the Levites, to every man according to his service. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two carts and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. And four carts and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service, under the hand of Ithmar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Kohath he gave none, because theirs was the service of the holy things, which they carried on their shoulders. They didn't need a cart, and they didn't need oxen to pull a cart, because everything that they did they carried with the carrying poles through the furniture in the ark. So uh, they received none. But let me just say that uh, this chapter, chapter 7, is a flashback. Actually, it's a flashback to one month earlier, right after the, right after the tabernacle had been set up and dedicated. But they were about to leave Sinai for the promised land. The Levites were in charge of transporting the tabernacle. The tribal leaders gave six wagons and twelve oxen to the Levites to help them with their job. Now, I'm going to read verses 10 through 17 because they reflect, really, what is stated over and over again through verse 89 of this chapter. But I'm just going to read it once, which is chapters or verses 10 through 17, and then I'll comment, just simply summarize and comment on the final 79 cha- or verses of this chapter. So let's look at verse 10. Now the leaders offered the dedication offering for the altar when it was anointed. So the leaders offered their offering before the altar. For the Lord said to Moses, They shall offer their offering, one leader each day, for the dedication of the altar. And the one who offered his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Amimadab, from the tribe of Judah. His offering was one silver platter, the weight of which was 130 shekels, and one silver bowl of 70 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, both of them full of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering one gold pan of ten shekels full of incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb in its first year as a burnt offering, one kid of the goats as a sin offering, and for the sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amimadab, Let's stop there for a second now. This was the first day. And this was the offering of this one man. Okay? Now, this one leader. For 12 consecutive days, 
one tribal leader after another brought the identical gift they brought identical gifts as offerings for the dedication of the altar so what you will have in the final 79 chapter final 89 verses of this chapter is the same thing repeated again and again each tribal leader bringing the same exact gift for 12 consecutive days we're not going to read that believe me we're going to skip down and look at chapter 8 now verse 1 and look at the arrangement of the lamps and it says and the Lord spoke to Moses saying speak to Aaron and say to him when you arrange the lamps the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand and Aaron did so he arranged the lamps to face toward the front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moses now this workmanship of the lampstand was of hammered gold from its shaft to its flowers it was hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses so he made the lampstand this holy lampstand has been described in detail back in Exodus chapter 25 so not going to get into that again let me just say the lampstand symbolizes God who created light and Jesus who is the light of the world you know that when God created light he said let there be light on the very first day and light started traveling at what is it 286,000 miles per second and it's been going ever since talk about an expanding universe but this light symbolized Jesus also who is the light of the world and uh, it was to be positioned so that its light would light up the holy bread that was situated in the same area as the, in the tabernacle look at verse 5 then the Lord spoke to Moses saying take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them ceremonially thus you shall do to them to cleanse them sprinkle water of purification on them and let them shave all their body and let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean before they could serve God the Levites had to be ritually cleansed first they had to be cleansed outwardly they had to shave all their hair from their body but they also had to be sprinkled with water you see this was their outward cleansing a shaving symbolized purity look at verse 8 then let them take a young bull with its grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil and you shall take another young bull as a sin offering and you shall bring the Levites before the tabernacle of meeting and you shall gather together the whole assembly of the children of Israel so you shall bring the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites and Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord as though a wave offering from the children of Israel that they may perform the work of the Lord so they had been cleansed outwardly ritually cleansed outwardly by shaving by uh, having themselves sprinkled with the water Okay, so they were outwardly cleansed next came their internal cleansing they were to offer one young bull as a sin offering for any unintentional sin they may have committed that means their sins of ignorance and a second bull was offered as a burnt offering and then the priests offered the Levites as a living sacrifice to God and that's what they were totally consecrated to the work of the Lord that's what God says that we're supposed to be doing and it doesn't matter if we preach or teach or or it doesn't matter if we work at a factory or whatever our lives can still be totally dedicated to the Lord because we do all things for the glory of the Lord no matter what we have to do and that's what the Bible says we are to do offer ourselves as living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God like the Levites because like the Levites you know we belong to the Lord these inward and outward cleansing rituals had to be performed before they could serve God and they symbolize the fact that in order to be used by God a person needs to be inwardly cleansed that means the new birth you know and outwardly cleansed 
That means confession of sin. Any sin that we may have committed since we've been born again. Look at verse 12. Then the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of the young bulls, and you shall offer one as a sin offering, and the other as a burnt offering to the Lord, to make atonement for the Levites. And you shall stand the Levites before Aaron and his sons, and then offer them as though a wave offering to the Lord. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. After that the Levites shall go in to service the tabernacle of meeting. So you shall cleanse them and offer them as though a wave offering. For they are wholly given to me from among the children of Israel. I have taken them for myself instead of all who opened the womb, the firstborn of all the children of Israel. For all the firstborn among the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them to myself. I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to do the work for the children of Israel in the tabernacle of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel, that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near the sanctuary. When Israel sinned, you know, God did not mess around, as we're going to see shortly. He punished them with plagues, death, and any number of other things. Even today, you know, we should know that God will not let His children get away with sin. The Levites were God's gift to his people. They kept the tabernacle running so that the common people wouldn't touch the holy things and suffer the consequences because that wouldn't be a very pretty sight. Coming in before the presence of the holy things in the tabernacle which symbolized God and his work and Jesus Christ and his work, a common person touching those things? No. Dead. Right on the spot. It's because a sinner can't come within the presence of the Holy God and expect to survive. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need Jesus. And that's the message. Look at verse 20. Thus Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so the children of Israel did to them. And the Levites purified themselves and washed their clothes. Then Aaron presented them as though a wave offering before the Lord, and Aaron made atonement for them to cleanse them. After that the Levites went in to do their work in the tabernacle of meeting before Aaron and his sons. As the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so they did to them. Verse 23 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is what pertains to the Levites. From 25 years old and above, one may enter to perform service in the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And at the age of 50 years, they must cease performing this work and shall work no more. They may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but they themselves shall do no work. Thus you shall do to the Levites regarding their duties." You say, why? Was God prejudiced? No, no, he was not prejudiced. God didn't want to put any Levites in a risky position. That's what this was about. You know, a boy or an elderly man could possibly weaken in the midst of serving in the tabernacle. You know, grow weak, something happen, or not be as coordinated as, as a young man or a man in middle age would be. So they could weaken in the midst of serving and maybe drop a a piece of temple furniture or something else, you know. And that would bring disaster upon them because God would not pull any punches. So he took precautions. As a result, they couldn't begin serving until they were 25 years old and they had to retire at the age of 50. God recognizes the fact 
that not everybody is qualified to do every work. You know, we're all gifted. We're all qualified. God has equipped each one of us to do something specific in the body of Christ. And somebody who isn't gifted in a certain area shouldn't try to do it because he will not have the blessing of God and he will not bless the people. Well, we'll pick up our study next time in Numbers chapter 9.